Hello everybody and welcome to another Room Rumble with uh, Mark Reed. and in this one I'm going into a after show for Standing for Truth. Um, there was a debate between um, Doc Dino, one of my good friends Doc Dino, and um, Kent Hovind on the um, geological column, so that's the fossils throughout strata um, showing that um, evolution is actually true. Now um, I, I got to be upfront with this one. Usually I wouldn't uh, go into a room rumble with people or try to get people in, but Doc actually sent me a message saying, hey, I wouldn't mind somebody else in here. So I actually went, oh, do I have to? And then said, yeah, okay, cool. Um, so, you know, going in there, it was just, what what, what struck me was, was Donnie was at the, and Donnie's kind of, he, he's he sort of gets fixated on this idea that you can compare biological organisms to cars or biological organisms to machines or biological organisms to factories and all of this kind of really bad analogies that we only use to be descriptive. We only say, hey, this this cell is like a machine, um, making it sort of an analogy with some of the functions that it's performing being similar to a factory producing a certain thing. Um, but he really takes it to the extreme that sort of because uh, cars are complex and because humans are complex, they were therefore both designed. And I I'm merely went in there because I've heard this rhetoric before. It's a really bad analogy. And I explained what exactly a false analogy means and why it is a logical uh, fallacy. Because the false analogy is basically saying, hey, two things have one thing in common. Therefore, everything else has to have everything in common or or you extend that to something that they don't in fact have in common or that you haven't proved, shown to have in common like saying that um um you know birds have wings and insects have wings therefore birds must have compound eyes you know it, it's that sort of thing um, because they both fly then therefore they have other traits in common and the same is true for cars like if you say hey cars are complex and have you know these certain things um they they have they come out in iterations they they get more complex they they um have um certain attributes like their um development over time then therefore they were designed and we know they were designed you know biological creatures they're complex they have certain iterations that come out they develop over time therefore they they're designed as well. No, that's a false analogy. You're taking two different things and, and the way that they're produced are completely different. So I, I highlighted some instances where you can show that that analogy is in fact false because it doesn't have an analogous property of the other thing. And also um, the, the two things are, have got significant differences, like the way that they do reproduce. Um, and, and Donnie sort of wants to say, hey, but you know these things will reproduce in the future i i don't i don't think that's still a good analogy because the way they're reproducing at the moment isn't the same it just isn't and once they do re, you know cars reproduce with dna maybe you can make that analogy but you can't so it is a false analogy um grayson pointed out something really brilliant and that is that every time we see a um iteration come out it is between two very similar um sort of models of biology like fish to tetrapods and you know basic tetrapods like land fish essentially and um we see say birds to dinosaurs oh dinosaurs to birds i'm sorry dinosaurs to birds or something that is very very similar we see mosaic species between them but what we do what we see in in uh, uh vehicles is is the meshing of two completely separate things like for instance i, I brought up a seaplane um, you know, we don't see a mosaic species between fish and birds. It, it isn't there. You know, we don't see that transition, but we do see that in um, vehicles. We have a seaplane, which is a plane and it has the attributes of a boat as well. It floats on water and it, you know, sort of has the attributes of a boat. So um, th this kind of thing showed Donnie to be wrong. So I think he got impatient towards the end. And then in comes Nephilim Free at the end. Nephilim Free is always uh, a, just, a, just a ridiculous person to be in a room with because the stuff that he says, and he, he bloviates. He, he really does, excuse me, filibuster. It just goes on and on and on and on. But he was talking about all of these 
you know, sort of papers that he found that said these things. Um, spoiler alert, when, I, when we got the links from him eventually, they were just to a random website. And there was no context that evolution was wrong in there. One person was calling um, another person's summation of a certain fossil just sort of ridiculous. And we don't even know who wrote this article. So he's basically trying to appeal to a scientific source while giving a non-scientific um, paleontology wiki, i.e. people just write in, with no author and, and taking that as a, a an authority. So there's the fallacy of argument from authority there. And this authority, A, we don't know who it is. B, we don't know what context they were using it. And it was just a website. It was it was the worst case of cherry picking I've probably seen ever. So that was an absolute, and I want to give you context with that because by the time the, the, the thing ended, he had made these claims that scientists had found evolution to be wrong. Not true. Absolutely not true. Complete lie. He basically cherry picked one sentence from a um, a secular, but a secular wiki um, online from an unknown author who was criticizing somebody's specific um, um, diagnosis or, or evaluation of one fossil and, and sort of took that, cherry pricked it and quote mined it to make it seem like, hey, he was saying all of evolution was wrong. No, no, he wasn't. All of all of paleontology was wrong. And the, the you know, sort of column was no, he wasn't. It was a complete lie by Nephilim Free, but, you know, that's Nephi. So if you wonder what Nephi's been doing, he's been trolling the internet for any, absolutely anybody t telling you that, that something's wrong and then using that to disprove evolution. Um, this one was fun. I, I did I did really like that I came in um, at the end of the day. Um, eventually, Neph just, just, you know, it's really funny at the end. Neph just keeps going on and on and on. And even even Donnie gets sick of it and just, just cuts him off, like just, just ends it. And, and I can't... You know, I'd love to say I blame him, but I can't because because Neff just he he doesn't shut up. He just he just keeps, you know, filling the the room with noise as his way of winning an argument. You know, just just keep talking. But um, yeah, I, I hope you enjoyed. It was a lot of fun. Um, and let's get ready to rumble. Are simply reflecting the intermediate ecosystems that they existed in, very similar to your military amphibious assault vehicle right here human yeah, engineers I would like to say something about that donnie because i think that's a false analogy sure go ahead yeah so it's a false analogy um vehicles don't breed they don't pass along genetics none of that is done it, it to find an analogy to um something it has to have the characteristics that meet for those two things. So if you want to make an analogy um, between amphibious vehicles and you know some some kind of car that would be fine because they have the same characteristics but the the way that genetics are passed down is not the same as designing uh, designing a car um and your model doesn't explain things like atavisms for instance like why a car doesn't doesn't suddenly have a bonnet of a model t ford for instance your model also doesn't understand uh, I, I explain sorry wh why why we, we don't have prototypes you know some some kind of car that's completely unrelated to any other car because it's like a a um um sort of a a, a, a proof of concept kind of thing um and that car would have absolutely no relation to any other car um because it, it has got unique parts to it we don't find that we find everything interlinked so your analogy fails on multiple levels because it doesn't actually take into account what we see in real life and cars do not breed with one another, pass information to one another and create baby cars with a combination of that information. That doesn't happen. So I appreciate that. I'd argue that that's an overall straw man. You've been corrected on that multiple times. I'll correct you on it again. And so as I iterated earlier, the design model would start with Genesis. This data, what I'm saying, didn't have to be true. We are said to be created or made in the image of God. And so therefore there should be something about us that reflects the divine. And so we are arguing, we are predicting, okay, if we look to the design world, then we What's should be able to get man? an idea. We should be able to get an idea into how God designed the biological world based on the way we design things. And so it didn't have That's to turn man. out that, well, I'm not done. It didn't have What's to turn out. Man? Your straw man is, 
well, cars don't reproduce. We understand cars don't reproduce. No, you're no, misrepresenting that's not, our no, model. No, no, that's well, not a Mark, straw man. I want to I'm not misrepresenting your yes, position. Yes, you are, because you don't... You, you, you're misrepresenting the design hypothesis that I'm putting forth, and then you're tearing down that misrepresentation. So you're not actually refuting or addressing anything. And so it didn't have no, to be I'm true. I'm addressing your analogy, just the analogy. No, the analogy does not break That's down simply because cars don't reproduce. We but understand that cars don't reproduce. I'm not straw manning your analogy at all. I, I would argue you are because the first thing you now, said was mm -hmm. cars don't pass on information. Cars don't breed. We do you understand agree with that? that. Adding. Do you agree with that? Yes. Then how am I straw manning? Then how am I straw manning? If because you you're misrepresenting that, the overall model that is no, making not. predictions. No, I am refuting making... your false analogy. No. That's all. Well, it's not a yeah. false analogy. Duncan, because He provided a valid critique hey. of your analogy. Hey, it's hey. valid. I, I just want I, to finish I, making my point because I hear a lot of crosstalk. I just want to finish man. making my point. No if if there's man. something that someone disagrees with, write it down. You'll have an opportunity to, to respond. And so it didn't have to uh, be true that if we were to look at the design world and we find that the design world, the way humans design things, fits the overall patterns that we see in the biological world. And so, yes, we do see human. Now, here's the thing. Reproduction adds complexity. Control it control. adds challenges and problems to the evolutionary model. Oh, that's sweet. That's for sure. Okay. Humans are not quite on the same level as, as an infinite God. So, yeah, God was able to design his creatures with the ability to reproduce, pass on their genes. Imagine human engineers were able to build these prototype vehicles that at that point could simply replicate. Well, they're going to save a lot of time, money, and maybe another 100 to 200 years in the future, we might get to that level because we're in the infancy of recognizing design. Okay. So, uh, so hold on. If I may interrupt you real quick, Donnie. So, uh, why don't maybe you have a question? My... Maybe you have, on, maybe you have a question, but so well, I was addressing them, but Fro interrupted. Oh, I'm, so, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But like, just real well, quick. I'd, I'd... I'd like to get to atavisms and and sort of factory mo like factory versus um, prototyping. Well, can, can you repeat your point about link? Because I would agree that all these vehicles can be linked due to similar materials used, similar metals. Uh, th they all share tires, have a lot in common where you can link them. Even a lot of these interesting, hard to classify okay. vehicles. So, so the thing is that a prototype or, or basically a proof of concept model is one that they've used to sort of do everything different. Like you, you have a few for prototype models that, that have come out that where they're unique, they're one of a type kind. They don't, they don't come out in lots. They're a unique vehicle as a proof of concept that someone has, has made, right? So where are we finding these? Because for a start, I didn't straw man you. I, I, your analogy is these things are analogous, and I address that analogy directly. That's not a straw man. That is your actual argument that these things are analogous, and I've pointed out where they are not, and it makes a big difference. So they don't breed, don't reproduce. Um, atavisms, you haven't addressed that. Where, where do these atavisms come from? Because we don't see cars produced with suddenly a bonnet from a Model T Ford, like this throwback. Can you, and yes, part of that atavism. Can you define an atavism? What's what's your understanding of an atavism? Well, an atavism is where you have a characteristic of a uh, previous um, model or or a previous um, organism um, that that no longer appears, like when chicken are mm. born with teeth, for instance, or humans have a sort of uh, a tail section to them. Like these, I understand. Okay, yeah, up. but here's the thing: birds in the fossil record, like Archaeopteryx, for example, had teeth, and so they've already got that information in in the genome. We're sure that could that could come about here in in extant versions. That's not my right? point. That's not my point. My point is that we should see the same thing. If it is an analogy, we should see the same thing happening with cars, and we don't. Well, no the analogy, analogy is like. We don't see a car being produced today that has like a Model T Ford engine, right? We don't see that. Can I say a real quick point? Sorry, because I'm fixing to have to go. Yeah, go ahead, Brian. Go ahead. All right. Uh, the point of his analogy was the engineering uh, aspect. Uh, since we see similarities in engineering, if creation was in fact designed by a creator, we would also see those same similarities. Um, 
And I, I, so I think you're you're just kind of traveling down the wrong road path there. Were you born but, or were you engineered? Were you born or were you engineered? I was born, but God created There you go. There you go. God no, you mankind. were born. It's I'm not me. the same process, so, so it's not an analogy. No, 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 no. No, it's you're, not. You're a fault. I think I think Donnie is right. You are attacking a straw man argument there. You're okay. Misrepresenting so for analogy. But anyway, I got to get going because I've got to uh, 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 help. Uh, my son needs my VR oh, headset. Oh, thank you. Uh, but anyway. Or night or right. whatever it is there. Oh, okay. First, right. I will Colin, say. Mark, my doc. Sure. Have a good one. Thanks for coming. Um, and I will say, I agree. Mark's position or Mark's response was not a straw man. He was directly. Correct. Addressing Donnie's analogy. With that said, Correct. if we are to follow the analogy, cars are engineered by humans. Humans are imperfect beings. I think we can all agree with that. That's why oh, yeah. cars fall apart and you need to get your oil changed and fill it up with gas. But if all living things were engineered by a perfect god... Why is it that human beings and other animals have so many flaws? Sin. Okay, so a few points there. I, I would still argue that it is a straw man because the analogy pertains to the patterns. Okay, we should be able to look to the patterns in which humans design and find similarities in those patterns in the biological world. And we do, we find homologous patterns we don't. in the biological world. We find that human engineers design in homologous patterns. We see human you, engineers design interesting intermediates. Can you tell me like, what a false analogy is to you, Donnie? Like what, what that means to you, a false analogy or a faulty analogy? Well, if you were to try and compare something, let's say, from the biological world to... No, no, no. The definition of a, a faulty analogy, like or a false analogy. Well, if I'm trying to make a point based on looking to something in the man-made world, I, the, what's your exact definition of an uh, analogy? Is that what you're asking? What's, what's your definition of, of an analogy? Well, a, a false analogy is one where because two things are alike in one way, they must be alike in another way right that that's what a false analogy is but it doesn't have analogy. to be it, that that is the exactly definition of a false analogy so if you're sort of saying hey these two things have these traits in comparison so therefore as a result of them being similar in this way they must be similar in other ways that is what a false analogy is just because they're similar in some ways doesn't mean they're similar in all ways and that's why it's a false analogy, because you're saying, hey, they all have characteristics that are shared. They all have that's sort of like me saying, well, because bats and birds both fly, they must all be from the same lineage or something. Right. That, well, no, you know, I, that, that would be a false analogy. But my comparison, again, has to do with, with the patterns. So do you disagree yes. that we find similar patterns i'm not saying it's an exact apples to apples where every last minute detail is the same but the overall patterns of let's say homology nested and, and nested hierarchies we do find a pattern in in man-made things and a pattern in the biological world would you agree with that uh not the there same patterns, patterns but they're not um, the same yeah, because there are things, like I pointed out, like atavisms and concept cars and things that fall outside right. that hierarchy. They're things that that are put into practice. You have people that, um, like I, I saw a article, and this is actually quite funny. A guy was arrested in my city for driving down a road on a motorized um, esky or a motorized beer cooler. Okay, which is just hilarious for a start, but we're not finding things like the motorized beer cooler of the the um, nested hierarchy of evolution of the cladistics. We're not finding that, right? So there are these exceptions to the the vehicle analogy that you've got that show that the analogy does not work, and the fact that they do not biologically reproduce, which is an, a, a a pivotal factor. Of, of this this analogy is that, hey, they can't all be related because we have this as well, 
it is a false analogy. You're saying, hey, they share characteristics, therefore they'd most, but they, they have to both be designed. No, that isn't the case. False analogy. And that's not a straw man of your position. That's a, that's, that is a, a, a logic and rationality based evaluation of your analogy that you're making. No, yeah, but so you're, I, you're I, I, using I, the I, same. I, I just want to. I just want to respond. I just want to respond. I'm simply comparing two things: something in nature, something in the design world, and I am showing some similarities, some ge a general pattern. Now, I'm not saying that it's exact it, in every single minute detail, because as I've pointed out, humans are just in the infancy of even recognizing design. We've just recently recognized the fact that designing intermediate vehicles serves a, a function for certain people that, that are looking for that type of thing. Okay. But the biological world, as you've said, which we would argue God has designed, has the ability to reproduce, to pass on their genes. We also understand based on what doc was saying that there's been degeneration, there's been death, extinction, mutation, accumulation since what we would argue was the creation event. OK, but with humans, yeah, every single vehicle, they have to design themselves. They have to make themselves. We haven't excelled or advanced to the point where we can make a bunch of archetypes, as the design diversity model would suggest. And then from there, those archetypes could replicate. I mean, there'd be a lot of people out of, out of a job, but that would be brilliant design. God's already thought of that. He's above and beyond that. So, yeah, it's not a perfect apples to apples comparison but we can discuss those differences atavism uh, sorry um, Go you talked about what i said earlier may i doc, first t rock hold, hold on doc um I, i've been listening for quite a while i just wanted to, to say something real quick donnie's analogy is perfectly valid because the whole point of separate ancestry is that you can reuse a concept without reproduction you, you create the first thing. You don't need reproduction to create the second thing. You just create it, but reuse the concept. And, and so it's perfectly valid. And one of, the, one of the points to be made there is that when you see homologies and, and things like that of, of any sort, atavisms um, included, one of the points to make there is that at the very best, it's agnostic. You can design it that way or it can be inherited that way. Still a false analogy. So this actually gets to the, the, what I think is the real crux of this art, or one of the real cruxes of this argument that I'd like to ask you a question about, Donnie. So you're saying, your, your argument is basically these nested hierarchies that we see in life, um, granting the premise that there are nested hierarchies in man-made vehicles, which I don't accept, but just running with that. Um, that there are similarities there, so we should expect uh, the same kinds of, of patterns of a nested hierarchy in life that we see in design. My question to you is, if human beings are limited by physical constraints and the materials they have at hand in order to design what they ultimately design, whereas right. the entity you're advocating for god in this case or the common designer is supposedly not restricted by any of that um has no physical limitations he could do it however he wants my question to you is you're saying we would expect this nested hierarchy what would you not expect of this common design model uh, in in terms of these patterns of similarities versus differences please answer right that's an excellent question so that's where I think this comes down to the discriminatory lines of evidence that we could look to to answer the question, which model is true, common descent or separate ancestry. What we would not expect to find is at the genotype or looking at the genetic content of the biological world, we would not expect there to be mostly junk evolutionary leftovers uh, genetic mistakes you know let's let's say the genomes of living organisms were only about 10 percent functional well that, that would be really related to the the question i brought up though because my question was specifically about what we would expect and not expect of common design 
regarding similarities versus differences among biological organisms, not junk DNA or anything like that. That's well, right, tangential but, to the question. But I'm saying that the homology, the nested hierarchical patterns, and the interesting mosaics or intermediates that we see in the design world, they are there for functional purposes. So we would also expect that the homology, the nested hierarchies, and then the interesting intermediates that we find in the biological world are also there for functional purposes. But if we were to find that they weren't there for functional purposes, then that would not be analogous to the design world because the design world, those patterns are there for functional purposes. Does that answer? I feel like it answers your question, but maybe not. I, I think so. But then I would disagree that the biological world is shared form for shared function. I don't think that at all describes right. what we see in I understand. And, and and that's where the debate is. Once we recognize that these patterns exist, and then the creationist model would predict that these patterns are there for functional purposes, for example, with the intermediates, I would argue that what we see in terms of stratigraphic intermediates in the fossil record, like the mammal, like reptiles, tiktolic, archaeopteryx, they are intermediate in their form they blend the features of, of these different uh, creatures because a lot of these creatures exist in intermediate ecosystems intermediate form due to intermediate ecosystems because we understand that environment oftentimes does dictate morphology or phenotype and so that's a so, working hypothesis right there that, that focuses not on all function. transitional forms we find in the fossil record are are living in Exclu exclusive or intermediate environments in the way you're right. phrasing it. Right. That's why I said most, yeah. because I think environments have changed over well, I don't time, think you've been right? most, so. but that's potato potato. Well, Tiktaalik. Does, does Tiktaalik exist in, in a, an environment? Well, that's, that's one example, but a lot of other know? examples don't fit that criterion. Hey, wait, 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 wait. I need, I need to ask Can this. I... Johnny, what environment did Tiktaalik live in? I think it's found in at the top of my head Devonian, which that's the age. What environment? Okay, like, what was yeah. the environment like? So, uh, was it very swampy because it was a, a it was suitable okay. for the fact that it it could go on land. It, it was a, a bottom dwelling lobe fin fish, in in some respects, and so it was able How... to hmm. leave its water environment come up on land and so i would assume some kind of so swampy or so, but, but, yeah. let, let me finish some let me finish this mark so you think that all of the rock layers were deposited in a flood right like the global flood of noah not all of them so I, you know, I, why, I well i'm just okay not all of them that's interesting but let's say the majority, especially the lower rock layers like the Devonian ones. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I, I would hold to a, a okay. probably high Cenozoic boundary. So if they were deposited in the flood, then why do you agree with conventional geology that it probably lived in a swamp? Shouldn't it like shouldn't all traces of its original environment have been destroyed? Well, where did it? How live? do you know it lived in a swamp? No, well, it, the answer is it, no, it, the, its environment should not have been destroyed. Didn't the flood wipe away everything? Wasn't that the but point? No, but, 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 but firstly, Doc, I want you to correct me if I'm wrong on your original question in terms of the environment it lived in. What, what I, I understand it was in the Devonian, but isn't isn't the Devonian represented by the actualist thinking of, of a very specific kind of environment during that time period? What, so, what was that environment? Not all what Devonian I'm saying, environment Donnie. Environment. Yeah, not all Donian environments were the same, but also, right, right, Donnie, exactly. I know how conventional geology reconstructs that environment. How right. do you reconstruct an organism's environment using flood geology? Are, are how do you, you saying know what that... environment it lived in? What data do you look at? Well, is it? It sounds like you have an assumption that the global flood would have destroyed any any trace of what that pre-flood environment for that species would have looked like. Or comprised. The purpose of the flood was to wipe away all traces of man's sin, right? Right. So it should well, have wiped I, I would everything assume away. There are ways that we can reestablish certain aspects of, of the pre-flood world 
based on looking at, at some of these ecosystems that were buried. Yeah, most of what we find would be transport, transported from one area to another, but typically aspects of those environments were transported with, with those creatures. T -Rock, T Rock, would you, would you agree with that? The, the flood would wipe away a lot of the geological features. Wasn't T Rock arguing that? No, that's, that's what he sure. was arguing earlier. A lot of them, no. but that's no. what he was arguing earlier. Yeah, no. you were. T Rock, what are your thoughts? Yeah, you were. The context. It's the context that matters. It, because Donnie kind of made the point already that, that what Doc Dino said um, alluded to this idea that the environment itself, all traces of it, have to go away and only Tiktaalik is left behind. And that's not what anybody thinks happened. No, I'm, I'm really talking about you sort of saying earlier that the lagoon features the... Um... The beds. What was the name for it? The bed forms. Was it some uh, yeah, bed, bed forms? The bed forms would be wiped away by the flood. So it seems like, to me at least, no, um, that you're sort right of either. saying, "Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on." That's what you said. That's what you said. I think that was just me. It seems to me. It seems to me. It seems to me that this will wipe away whatever is convenient and leave whatever is convenient to you. That's yeah, but that's not what he was talking about at the time. It was just a hypothetical that we were discussing in regards to snails and and uh, shells and hard body and soft bodied fossils. So I think you're mistaken in regards to what he said in regards to the claim. It was he was still better. saying the environment should be wiped away, so we can't Correct. reconstruct the that's environment not, from what is in the what area. Correct, because he was disputing that it was a lagoon. I was paying very close attention because he was disputing that it would be a lagoon. Yeah, in, in either case, it was, it was a hypothetical. So it's it's not like he stated that each and every. <laughs> Oh, it's it's all across the world is going to be exactly the hypothetical like hypothetical isn't the important no, no, part no, no. the important no, no, is consistency you you're, you're making an extrapolation it's a, it's, it's it's a logical fallacy you're trying to say that because he made a statement of, in, in regards to one particular scenario that we can extrapolate this and say that every single scenario every single area that we look all across the world in that period of time was exactly just like that that's, that's right. Wrong. It's called yeah, that's, you, that's you, that's you, that's you started off with no, no, sorry, but you started off with this false dichotomy. I want to bring this back a little bit because you're kind of going away from the whole patterns what, thing that what, Donnie was talking dichotomy? about. No, no, you brought up what this dichotomy? false dichotomy about saying how what dichotomy? Donnie, what was the how dichotomy? Donnie's observed observation. What was the dichotomy? Hold on, hold what, was the dichotomy? Stop well, what was the dichotomy? I don't even know what the dichotomy is. You got to stop is. talking to here, buddy. You got to stop talking to here. Well, you got to stop talking to here. No, no, no. I'm talking, I'm telling you, Donnie brought up this whole very interesting uh, start with the patterns of observation with the manufacturing and design that we can observe. And he was trying to say, you know, hey, maybe this is a good start to making a natural observation and saying, you know, maybe this is, it alludes to a, a common des uh, a designer, right? So we started off that way and you guys jumped in dogpile and that's okay but just to bring it back there i think it's better off that we discuss the idea of how we allude that to nature and think of the pattern concept in regards to what we can observe in reality across different species that have nothing to do with each other instead of sitting here and trying to extrapolate that this person said that and this person said that so let's take a moment and go back and think about how common how, how these design the elements Remember how I just said you were trying what to was say. A dichotomy? That, no, no, no. Do you understand what a dichotomy is? I don't understand what a dichotomy is, apparently, but that's not the point. Okay. okay. In either so case, you understand. A, okay, a okay. No, no, no. I don't well, need the explanation. Me, I didn't ask you for the explanation. Then. No, I don't need it. Okay, so you don't want to know. I don't want the explanation from you. I'm talking here. I don't need you to sit here wow. and start acting like as if you're some authority. Okay? Don't pontificate. We're trying to have a nice conversation about whether Who's or not pontificating right now. What we can observe. <laughs> what? <laughs> I think. Okay. I, so okay. I, I'd like to address this because back. this really was aimed at me. This really was aimed at me. So I'd like to address it now. You, you sort no, of said, it's yeah, not about you. Some... It's not about you at all. Please don't make this about you. I don't understand why you're trying to take the mic. Okay. Don't make this so about you. Don't shut up. No. A false dichotomy that doesn't exist. Mark, if, if, if I, 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 I the, the, the word dichotomy was well. incorrect. Let's move on. Well, you're, this, you're, I, you're a big boy. You well, this idea of a dichotomy. Did you mean just talking about? Because if we're comparing two things, you know, black and white is, it, you know, uh, if you look at political systems, is it just right, left? You know, that's kind of. So some would say that's a false dichotomy. Maybe it's somewhere in the middle. And so this dichotomy of the biological world 
versus the design world? Is it extreme? Is it just black and white? Or is, is there a, an overall analogy there in terms of the patterns? But then when we look to the details, we are going to find some, a, a level of deviation from the overall analogy simply because we're dealing with a biological world that we're arguing God designed versus an engineered world that, that man is, is essentially in charge of. Mm -hmm. So it's not really right, black. And it's not as black yeah. and white as I feel like, Mark, you may have been uh, attempting. No, to and, and AR, no, AR, I don't AR, think that's a great case. point. Can I, can I, can I, can I say something? Was asking can I about, say something? I think, I think we're going no, back because to just you, talking you can about, and I haven't been me. able to say anything at all. I've been cut okay, off. Okay, let's do this. To be fair, Mark, we'll let you go. Yeah, to be fair, we'll let Mark go, and then... Just yeah. talking about what happened. Yeah, so, so I'm not making a dichotomy between the biological world and a human designed world. For instance, you know, there are biological things that are human designed. You know, we have um, sort of, you know, Monsanto creates biological organisms that are designed to eat oil and, and do these things. So I'm not making a dichotomy between those at all. What I'm saying is, and, and sort of you can point to natural observations and say, hey, um, we design things. I think the world is designed. That's fine. What I'm saying is the analogy between cars and human-made um, engines and, and things that are um, um, sort of uh, 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 human-designed is a false analogy because it lacks a lot of the traits that we would associate with the biological world. That's all. So this sort of, well, um, it, it can't, you know, I can't say that. It's like, well, yeah, I can, because the analogy falls down on a number of crucial, crucial areas. And one of those is is the the, the way that we, we pass along um, design blueprints of these things. Like right. the, the cars aren't replicating. They're not passing their blueprints right. to one another. It, it's because we the, haven't advanced right. that far well, technologically just, just, speaking. Just let, me, let, me, let me talk. Let me talk. They're not passing along the blueprints to one another to merge those blueprints to create a car that is an amalgamation of both design blueprints. So it cannot be a decent analogy. It is a false analogy. Well, I think it's it a great analogy. Traits. No, right. Oh, it's right. terrible. It's one of so the great okay, analogy. Okay, but the thing so is, we are simply yeah. saying, hey, because these things are designed, they will share all these other traits, kind of thing. Be because right, Mark, thank, thank you, thank you for reminding us about common. what you said, and thank you for reminding us about what you said because that's what you were trying to interrupt me before about to. Yeah, to, I, that's to not a that false analogy. Okay, all, right, all right, so now, now that we are reminded of what you said, it, it's actually so. This whole thing is very cool. So you're saying that this pattern idea is uh, you, you can't take the pattern idea and compare it to nature. All right, fine. Yeah, okay, but it's just it's a very nice way to start thinking because also you can't take two two fossils that are kind of similar to each other and say, hey. They're related. They're evolutionarily linked because you, you'd be oh, using the same exactly logical policy do, that you just but... used about Ghani's mm -hmm. ligament. But nonetheless, we can kind of take it from there and say, hey, maybe there's something that we can observe from our natural world and see if there is a natural law behind it, because that's how we have discovered a lot of different things, such as gravity, you know, an apple fell. We're like, oh, hey, maybe there's something to this. Let's see if it's right. So, yeah. We can actually observe the natural behaviors that we as humans do and even animals do and say, hey, maybe there's something behind it that could possibly be a law of nature. So I think it's very, val it's very valid what Donnie said, especially when you think, when you say, oh, these two fossils where we have no possible idea about any soft tissue linkage we just see a skeletal system that kind of look alike we're going to say mm -hmm. they're different mm -hmm. and they're evolutionarily linked rather than just claiming they're I mean, nuts. both, they're both I mean, on, it, on both sides it, of the equation right. they're both logically fallacious if you want to say I, donnie is mm -hmm. logically fallacious you are also logically I, fallacious but because there are no actual transitional fossil links but we it, can start if i may really if you want to talk soft tissue we have no, I don't. Actually, I like, I like what A.R.E. brought up before. He said, if God was going to design this whole system, would he design, would he be so simple or would he be more complex with the mm -hmm. types of different so things, bad. even if they're the same parts? And you know what? That's These are the types of questions we should be asking. Are this a systematic questions of the whole evolutionary slash uh, change slash natural, whatever you want to call it, process. That's what we should be talking about. 
You know, not you whether we that? can't you spend believe 20 that, minutes that's not science. on logical policy. You can and believe that, but that's not like, science. That's because what that is done, exactly science. What you that is exactly done, what science. Science is you what make you an observation done, in the natural done, world, what you have and then you create an experiment. Hey guys, a little bit of cross no, 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 I don't want you to. I don't want you to miss what you have science and science. You've taken your conclusion. You've taken your conclusion that they have been designed. And now you're looking for places where you can go, no, oh, what's designed? Just, no, How, what does incorrect. that have in common with what we see in the biological literally world? literally did not just say so that. So you're I starting said that, with no. your conclusion and then working towards it. did not. I did not. I just described the whole like No, this is wrong. Like please, that. please. You this said is, it was what you're saying is wrong. Is wrong. It's, it's, it's turning into a bit of a dumpster fire. I'm trying to be nice, cordial. No, it's just I'd like to make sure that I'm not... Being, I appreciate the uh, point. You know, from... having this red herring straw man go, going on, yeah. You know? okay. hey, hey, guys, little, let, let's go back to uninterrupted responses. Mark, you start, and then we'll go from there. Yeah, so you said it's a nice way to start thinking about it, but it isn't a nice way to start thinking about it. it it's uh, irrational and it's illogical when you start to use false analogies. When you start to say, hey, um, you know, these guys are on a baseball team. People have brothers on the baseball team. Therefore, they have brothers. That's a false analogy. Um, you can't start making conclusions based upon similarities and then extending those similarities to cover everything. Like I gave you earlier with the bats and birds have similarities, therefore they they came from the same place. You can't make that analogy. But that's not what we're basing okay. evolution on. We're basing evolution on a number of scientific principles where we're saying, hey, we observed this, let's do testing, let's do this process and find out what the conclusion is. You guys are starting the other way around. You're getting the conclusion and then using a false analogy to try to fit what you okay. think with the natural right. world. So I need to stop Make you there because you obviously you're mixing up what I just said and you're misrepresenting everything I just said. And in fact, you flipped it around. What you just described is actually what is going on when you're trying to try uh, trying to use two different fossils and uh, and shapes to link them together through an evolutionary process. And uh, what uh, I described yeah, is I said I said, "Hey, you observe something in nature and you're like, wait a minute, maybe there's something more to this." And then you go on using the scientific method to set up a series of tests that you can repeat that could re re lead to observable data that you can st study and put together. That's what I'm saying. And I'm saying that Donnie's observation of a repetition of patterns between and, uh, and different things between created items in our natural world is something that we can observe and try to then move forward to see if this is something that we can conclude is a part of the natural, uh, uh, the genetic coding. I didn't make a conclusion. I said, we start off with an observation, a hypothesis. That is science. This is the scientific method. You start with the hypothesis and then you go on and you start uh, test it to see whether your hypothesis or null hypothesis is more likely to occur. That's so what I said. It would lead what to that, you're saying if I may. started off with the conclusion, that's wrong. That's a misrepresentation. So, so please, no. let's be more simple may, and I think about something? this from an esoteric perspective and how this could relate on a larger systematic uh, scale. Esoteric perspective? I thought you were being oh. scientific. What do you mean oh. by esoteric? Like oh. hidden knowledge? Oh, okay. I see. So what what, what about everything else I just said? Before you answer, what, please, what Donnie, can I, I request said, something? Hmm. Okay, sure. Donnie. I mean, I can address that. If okay, you let's throw it to Doc. Let's throw it to Doc. He, but I, I'm he, like, okay. letting Doc go. Just First, just a, just a quick request. Can we please keep responses to 30 seconds or less? I feel that would be beneficial for the flow of the conversation. Just a request. I'm not the lead. I'm not the leader here. I, I think, especially for the last 30 minutes here, as I did say, we're going to do about a four hour show. Let's try and make mm -hmm. it a little bit more organic now with uh, responses that are not as, as lengthy, I guess. I, I think we've all had a, a lot of time to make our points, which is good. Mm -hmm. And so I, I would like to make a quick point and then anybody can jump in. It'll be really quick because, again, it does go back to what Mark is talking about in terms of testable predictions and also mm -hmm. what Andrew was talking about in terms of what would we expect versus what we would not expect. 
And so, yes, I would argue that these overall patterns, although they're not perfectly analogous to the biological world, because we are in the infancy of recognizing design, we have not advanced enough where we can design archetypes, let's say vehicles. Let's just say we were able to design this amphibious, military amphibious assault vehicle. We design one, an archetype. And then from there, it can just replicate itself. Yeah, we haven't advanced that far, but we have an overall pattern that we can work with here. And now we can make testable predictions. And so we would argue, okay, these patterns exist in the man-made world due to functional reasons. And so the biological world, those patterns should also be there for functional purposes. So rather than nested hierarchies by descent or through descent, we would argue it's nested hierarchies through function. Okay, and then that's where we can kind of, I think, advance the ancestry debate is, is engaging that issue. Go ahead. Anybody can jump in. So, so, may, may, I, may I ask something, please? I've been wanting to ask something. Yeah, go ahead, sorry, sorry, Doc. Yeah. You're, you're fine, Mark. So to the creation side, and anyone can grab this. Does anyone know how, let's just stick with Tiktaalik. Anyone know how Tiktaalik was predicted and why it was predicted? Anyone can take it. I can answer that. Yeah. I'd... Uh, well, I'd like a creationist I, 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 first I, I, if none of them want to. Then. I'm happy to, but I don't want to hog. The, if T Ronk wants to do it, I can do it. Whoever wants I, to do it. I know roughly. I'm not going to be super pristine with it, but I know roughly the idea was that um, some pre Devonian layers contained fossils from like a marine environment and some post. Devonian fossils contained organisms from more of a land based. And so somebody said, hey, somewhere in between there, we should find a transitional fossil. And so they identified a particular formation. I think it's in Canada, but I'm not sure about that. Yeah. Uh, that mm -hmm. said, um, okay, so this, this transition between this deep marine and this land environment should contain organisms that um, are approaching sort of an end amphibious state well, well more, sure. also more that's actually not a bad well sorry i have a line of questioning here that's not a sorry. bad that's not a bad summary that's pretty accurate related to that how was australopithecus predicted again anyone can take it because it was well, predicted does anyone know well when they're making predictions from my understanding the evolutionary community are going to look to two species or organisms that they believe their starting point is that these organisms are closely related like humans and then non-human primates okay so rather than saying well we're going to find a transitional form between humans and a banana plant or humans and a fish well those two organisms they share too distant of an ancestor so they're going to look to humans and the non-human primates and they're going to look for what's called if if i understand correctly they're going to look for both uh, basal and derived features that should be present in a common ancestor in a certain layer if, if that existed. And so the evolution community would argue that the Australopithecines meet that criteria. So they, they predict a very specific morphology. Okay, that's well, pretty good too. So so they 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 here's, here's my last point, and I'll need about a minute for this. So we know how we got, how we predicted Tiktaalik. I predicted Australopithecus. To add to Australopithecus, uh, Darwin hypothesized that it, or at least something like it, would be found in Africa because chimpanzees are very similar to humans and they're in Africa. Now, lastly, Archaeopteryx was also predicted. And it was predicted because a lot of paleontologists noted the distinct similarities between birds and dinosaurs. And then, two years after The Origin of Species was published, we found Archaeopteryx. The evolutionary theory, because it is a theory, consistently makes these predictions, and those predictions are consistently fulfilled. Just add so, one can any creationist give a good explanation that. for why that is? So, yeah, what are these are creationists question. making? What predictions are creationists let, making? Let me, let me Actually, could I it. tackle that real quick, T Rock, maybe for 30 seconds, then you take the last 30 seconds? And to the evolutionist side, if you disagree with what I say and T-Rock says, note it down, you'll get a chance to respond. So I would argue that the predictions are not 
that specific. For example, you look to an environment like the Devonian where Tiktaalik is found, and then you predict the kind of creature like Tiktaalik that would actually fit that environment, and then you find it. It'd be like me pointing to the sky and saying, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look up in the sky and find a bird today. Well, yeah, birds fly in that environment. That environment is, is suitable for birds. I don't think it's specific enough, especially the fact that with Tiktaalik and the Australopithecines, we see a lot of overlap. We see a lot of uh, intermingling and coexistence. And so with Tiktaalik, they actually discovered tetrapod foot tracks in Poland that predate, here's Tiktaalik right here. Here's Archaeopteryx mm -hmm. right here. Okay, they found tetrapod foot tracks that predate Tiktaalik by about 20 million years, according to the conventional time. And so that means you have uh, true tetrapods down here before you actually have Tiktaalik. And I understand the evolutionists would say, well, the transitional form doesn't have to be the direct ancestor. It's just that this is a, repre uh, a representative of what that transitional form would have looked like, but, looked like. But that's the point is now it's agnostic because that's what the creationists would mm -hmm. argue is that we have coexistence. We have intermingling between all these different kinds of, of creatures. Go ahead. So I have something to okay, say. So, after T-Rock. Okay. Just, so, uh, so, um, Echoing Donnie's sentiment, the, the problem with calling Tiktaalik a prediction that specifically endorses evolution above creation, the problem is deep time does not have to be true for you to identify that an amphibian lives between a, a, a deep water environment and a land environment. Deep time does not have to be true. If you want a, a valid prediction that matters, you need to demonstrate that deep, deep time is a critical part of the prediction because that's what separates uh, creation from evolution. Tectolic oh. isn't an amphibian right. for a start. It's I not didn't a, say a, it was. A, that, that wasn't the point. Well, you said I predicted an amphibian, and that's not the we're case. Talking plus, we're talking, we're talking excuse me, excuse me, T-Rock, 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 excuse me, you did say an amphibian. It's not a great big deal to predict an amphibian. It's not an amphibian. It's a fish with wrist bones right and a rudimentary lung structure that is not as mm -hmm. as um that is not a vague prediction as don is making out that's a very specific thing and they they said mm -hmm. hey it will be found in this layer and it will be found in fresh water because we know that the more basal forms that we've been seeing are from fresh water so they went and looked in the one of the very likely spots that fresh water did exist and that those organisms were and they found exactly what that was. That's not a vague prediction. That isn't a, and, oh, well, we'll find something roughly like this. They made a very specific prediction. Darwin made a very specific prediction in saying we'll find a bird with, ooh, with Mark, unfused can I, can I take wing this? fingers. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, Doug. It's okay. It's just I think Mark and I have uh, convergently happened upon where I was going to go with this. So with Archaeopteryx, dawn of evolutionary theory, Darwin predicted we would find a bird that looked like a dinosaur with teeth, clawed hands, and a long tail. We find Archaeopteryx years later with exactly what Darwin predicted. With Australopithecus, Darwin went further. He predicted we would find a bipedal ape in East Africa with features intermediate between humans and chimps. And he was more specific than that. I'm generalizing for the sake of time. And then lastly, with Tiktaalik, we predicted, again, gills, lungs, wrists, and the particular features it would have for the environment we predicted being basically like a fishy crocodile, a uh, ambush predator. We predicted the time, like the age of the rock it would be in. And the location so well, the first Tiktaalik was found, I think, within just a couple of weeks of them starting searching. Yeah. We predicted very specific things, and this happens all the time in evolution. These are just the most famous cases. If just, evolution okay. and deep time don't work, how can we consistently make these predictions and have them fulfilled? Right. So quick and just to, just to say dog. one last thing, no, no, just one last thing, just quickly, T. I'll, I'll be real quick. Um, because just talking about said this thing about oh well, we see observations, we do testing. So I really want to push on this. What testing 
And what testable predictions have creationists made for their model? Well, I've already gone over at least one major prediction, which has to do with function. Function for the patterns that we see. So if we look to the genetic patterns that are homologous patterns that are nested hierarchical patterns, we would predict function there. And we have evidence for activity, but we don't really know for sure what the very specific functions are for all of that activity. So that is a future testable prediction that future observations and well, sort of what you have laboratory asking, experiments what you have made what you have made that has come true not sort of things into mm -hmm. the future but like we're talking about times when um the evolutionary model has predicted certain things like very very specific things creationists don't mm -hmm. seem to be doing the same if you could point out where creationists are doing the same thing i would love it and if i how, how, how many of these have been more... found well, just a second. Like, what's, what's if I may, it's more. Well, In words. fairness, T Rock did want to talk as well. I'll just say that. Yes, yeah, so never mind. My brain. I had a question. Oh, a, 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 a T Rock, if, if I could just real quick, because uh, Mark Reed asked a question, I just wanted to pull up a slide. So, what's fascinating about the head to head prediction on DNA function versus mostly junk or evolutionary leftovers is it's a prediction that is more and more verified or confirmed as time goes on. Because the more DNA testing we do, firstly, your gold standard of DNA testing, I would argue, is most likely genetic knockout tests. But obviously, it's unethical to knock out genes in humans. And so we're always going to be very limited in our ability to determine what is and what isn't functional. But over the years, every every single month, you're getting more and more papers. Dr. Rob Carter, he's been doing a two-part commentary. I think he might be continuing it, going over a, a slew of new 2024 papers that's discovering more, more function. And so this is just more and more confirming creationist predictions on DNA function. Because if you go back 30 years, mm -hmm. what we now know about the genome is completely different. So I got a I, quick question, a quick yes or no mm -hmm. question for Mark. When you asked the question, what what predictions does creation make? Were you wanting yeah. to limit the scope to only the biological world? Well, yeah. Okay, that's okay. Fair enough. That's fine. So also, if I <laughs> may, kind, real quick, kind of funny. that felt like a non sequitur. Sorry. It's it, it kind of funny, but I actually had one of my own predictions. Well, we're talking the, about sort of um, um, fossils and, sure. and sort of seeing what occurs in the record. So, yeah, sure. um, I, okay. I think sort of if, if the model of separate um, created kinds, which, I mean, that raises some questions alone, like like was Tectolic a separate created kind? Was, was you know, some the, uh, Archaeopteryx a separate created kind? I don't know. But if we're talking about that, what predictions of creationists used with their model to come up with finding these kind of fossils? Okay, so so to answer your question, what kinds of predictions? So there's there's a variety of different types of predictions directly associated with the biological world, but um, most of what you guys have described is actually just um, pattern recognition, not um, worldview specific kind of predictions it's pattern recognition but i have i actually have my own personal prediction that i made that i found out um a, i think a couple years after i i said this that it was true and that is um c14 in soft tissue and so there has actually been a korean study showing that uh, c14 is um originating from soft tissue finds not external contamination is that a paper how do you know it creation? wasn't from external contamination if i may ask yeah that's i mean that's a that's a good mm -hmm. question because what the study was doing was taking um a, a variety of samples from the point of the uh the fossil and basically tracing samples away from the fossil in in right. in the ground in the in the the stone in which it was encased and so what they were doing was hey, Rock, do you have a link 
can you can you listen for just a second um what they were doing was plotting the concentrations of c14 from the center of the fossil out away from it and so if it's contamination it should gradually decrease c14 concentration as you approach the fossil but if it's coming no, from the fossil it should decrease moving away from it not necessarily <clears throat> No, not not necessarily. Because no. if you have like something like um, bacteria in the organism, like gut bacteria or something like that, that after it dies, it starts to eat its way out. Um, that's going to th completely throw off that that thing. I don't think you can sort of um, judge whether C fourteen is a contaminant or not by its levels around the organism. I don't. I don't think that's a thing, T. Uh, it, it, if it were contamination, I would actually expect the concentrations or ratios you measure, or the ages you're getting for different parts of the fossil or around the fossil, would vary quite a bit, but still be yeah. within the error bars of the experiment that would naturally and be the result so of it, if, I may, if i may real quick thinking is that you have to have a pathway for contamination to get to the fossil yeah. that's kind of the whole point you have to have a pathway yeah. for this contamination and if there's a so, pathway Pira, that means the concentration be background contamination be well one at a time one at a time guys yeah sorry I brought in by enforcer Pira, he is junior can I, T Rock, can yeah. you please tell me at least one of the authors? Can you get a link, a title, anything, please? I think last I'm time right we did a paper like this, you I guys you were from, misreading you guys for a background I'll, I'll readings. Some, hey, I'm, you I'm guys chat sure for a minute, and I'll post you something, Doc. Okay. Have. So, in terms of the prediction, specifically on the fossils. I've been pointing out how environment oftentimes, and I think it's a good question for Mark, environment oftentimes dictates phenotype. Well, Creatius have been saying for years, I know Dr. Kurt Wise, he has a PhD in paleontology, if I'm not mistaken, that we should find these kinds of morphological intermediates. I hear a little bit of background noise, not sure it's who it's from. But Sorry these kinds that. of morpho oh, that, that's okay. These morphological intermediates that will be inhabiting these intermediate ecosystems like what we find with with tiktaalik as tiktaalik was so found can i provide in an a, environment a, that's suitable to how to many phenotype of them i mean that's pretty so vague can I, can I give a counter example to that sure that that environment intermediate thing so uh w one example off the top of my head is uh bacillosaurids and species of cetaceans closely related to them they're obviously fully aquatic yet they still display transitional morphologies between modern whales and uh more basal cetaceans so that what environment intermediate thing doesn't really work what kind of intermediate environment would exist in the ocean for some of these oceanic intermediate exactly no, what? none of them yet they still just they're fully aquatic they live in the open ocean yet they still display transitional features so that's would you point. say that's an except would you argue that's an exception to the rule or the rule no your rule is I not a rule say that's generally the rule i mean i just i just joined so i'm not sure how you're defining intermediate environment but i would i would think that uh if you have um tetrapod fish coming on land that some type of a wetlands or like a mud environment would be intermediate there's no intermediate environment there's yeah no I, intermediate I've, I've never heard this term yeah we yeah, do it's, it's made term. up it's not well, for example term. tiktaalik exists in an aquatic e ecosystem no 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 able to Look, go from sea to land honey Donnie, things are intermediate, like they will have a change in environment or they'll have an environment where maybe a different morphology would be a, a more advantageous. And so the, the, the organism itself, like its population, becomes intermediate between two stages, like land and, and water going. But it's not that the organism, it's not, sorry, it's not the environment that is intermediate. It's just right. that the organism changes and the stages in between are in the intermediate, like the Psilosaurus, which lives in open ocean, but does have morphology for um, um, rear legs, isn't it, Andrew? Um, and and so yeah, uh, vestigial um, hind legs, yeah. Or, well, actually, actually uh, pretty visible hind legs. Uh, yeah, that, okay, that so distinction between like a land and water environment, like that kind of thing where it's pretty cut and dry, That that's not what you typically find with these these fossils. Are you saying that Basilosaurus has vestigial hind legs or actual hind legs? 
like a uh they're like they're vestigial in the sense creature. that they obviously can't support it on land but they're they're still visible the the bones are all still there they're they're hind limbs in that sense in, in the same way that we animal. see in the same way that we see aquatic whales today having no. vestigial no, hind they're, legs? they're 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 not as reduced as modern whales they're actual hind limbs but they obviously couldn't function on on land as hind limbs so in that sense what was vestigial. their function for though are you saying i'm not that sure how i like you're implying that vestigial means there's no function left you seem to right be well it would be agnostic I, I would argue that this is revisionism I, I i think you can go back far enough to where vestigial organ or structure was defined as something losing its function once oh, they discovered that, 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 be, that i can show you I, I, i've got some articles from dr jerry bergman where he has quotes i, I, I can where they show define, you what's, what's, with the, what's with the crosstalk i'm trying to finish my point i got three yeah, evolutionists let's, let's, uh, let's let people talking, finish right? so i can Nobody show talk you donnie's talking i could show you <laughs> articles from dr jerry bergman who's documented quotes from the evolutionary community going back, I don't know, 80 years ago, where they defined vestigial structure organ as not having a function. Then when they started discovering all these functions for these vestigial structures, then they said, well, it, it's all, it, it can also alter its function. So there seems okay, to be some and I can provide quotes from Darwin's writings and his, his contemporaries that don't use that definition of useless structure. What was Darwin? Can you share my screen? Can you play share my screen? Uh, the the same, the true. same definition I'm providing of a, a reduced or leftover structure in that sense, but not necessarily completely useless. Even if we grant so you that, a, I mean, words change their meaning. I mean, well, I, I would just argue worst thing. case scenario. I, if that was the true definition since the beginning, I would just say it's another agnostic line of evidence. We would say, okay, it has a function, so it's there for a functional okay. reason. You guys would say, well, it's altered its function. Okay, well, so it's this agnostic is, then. <laughs> this is Bacillosaurus hind limb. Okay, this yeah, is the, the actual bones of the, the hind limb of the Bacillosaurus. And this is a uh, animal that lived entirely in water just as a whale does. So um, we, we know that this limb absolutely could not support it on land and it did not go on land. Like it was a ocean bearing creature. This, this hind limb is, is tiny, atrophied, but it is there. Do they have those hind limbs or is it inferred based on a few? That's, that's it, the skeleton. It's found with the rest of the skeleton, that's yes. The actual, yeah. And uh, modern yeah, whales. Are we assuming uh, that it, there's nothing else there that it did as far as the soft tissue? Because we can only see the bone. We don't well, know what was there. I, I can say, Doctor, sort of I, 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 I can point out the fact that Doctor. Like that. Okay, I, I can point out the fact that Doctor Jonathan Sarfati he did confirm that they have these small hind limbs, but he argues that they were probably used for grasping during uh, reproduction as many in the evolutionary community have even admitted. Okay, so why so they look like that's what I was alluding to. Why not? Some sort of sexual designed it completely differently. Well, the Basilosaurus is a very interesting whale kind of creature that looks different than any kind of whales we have today. So it's its form, its its morphology is therefore slightly different. I guess its hind limbs were a it little bit Nostrils larger than the, in the yeah, way up the guys, skull. one on the, the one on the top, the one on the top is the Celosaurus, Just pointing that out, because it's just very interesting what Donnie mentioned. Because yeah, there's there's also these dimorphism features that we don't we don't know. Maybe it's a sexual characteristic that it uses to attract the female or the, uh, the opposite sex, and there's something with the soft tissue that we don't understand. So we can say from a skeletal perspective, we can. Maybe there's no purpose, but there, the, the, this is just part of the story. Well, see, that's oh, it, it looks like there was no purpose. I said there, it looks like here. I, the I didn't say they had no purpose, I was saying they have no purpose as hind limbs, for, right? For and, and, I, and I'm right. saying, right, and, and so that would be your interpretation, and, and it's interesting. OK, but I would argue that it's it's agnostic because then we would say, OK, is, is there a function? Is it using it for something? And Philip Jandrich here. He says, it seems to me that they could only have uh, been some kind of sexual or reproductive clasper. OK, well, you would say it's been repurposed from being hind limbs to now functioning in reproduction. We would say it's it's designed. Its original function was for reproduction. So now it's okay, agnostic. So, 
That's so, my whole point. So we have modern animals today that have claspers, though, for that specific purpose, and they don't right. look like hind limbs. So why were they okay. specifically designed to look like miniature hind limbs in this case? Well, we don't yeah. have anything today that looks like Basilosaurus. That would be terrifying. No, but we, we do have different. modern animals that use claspers for the purpose you just described. Right, and, and Basilosaurus. Like so are like you saying Basilosaurus did not use this structure for reproduction? No, for, for all we know, it might have. But I'm saying they don't need to look like miniature reduced hind limbs with the hind limb bones there to have that purpose as we now right. see modern animals that ha that do that sort of thing, but they don't have any hind limbs. It's just variation in design. I mean, right. See, it's yeah. a good question. Yeah, yeah. It's a good question, Andrew, but it's just variation in design. I mean, go Google how many different kinds of steering wheels. So what are. variation it's would you not how expect? Many, how many of those Brassosaurus hind leg specimens are, exist in the world? Uh, we have a few. Like, how, yeah, can we uh, just, yeah. not, not uh, like, it's several like, a range. like from, do you think maybe there's 20 have, of them in the world? If, if I may, we have Bacillosaurus yeah. remains from all over the U.S. and cool. Africa and the Middle East. We have a, we lot, have of a lot of very interesting, it, 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 like there's 20 a, 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 there be, because there was more overall dive, like today's just a, an overall snapshot of the diversity that's existed on this planet. So when we look to the fossil record, we find a huge multitude of interesting creatures that we could classify as intermediate or mosaic, or you guys want to say transitional, that don't exist today. That's because there was overall more diversity anyway. So yeah, we see variation in design, just like we see variation in the design world in terms of uh, man-made engineering systems. And we have claspers here in Basilosaurus. Basilosaurus is, is unique in the sense that we don't have any Basilosaurus today. And so it seems to have had a variation in the structure that is involved in reproduction. I don't see, I, I see how it's agnostic, as in it is what you'd expect. But since it has a function and we predict function, then we can also explain the data. Well, so it's, well, it's well since you mentioned variation there, that's that's one of the points I was I was trying to make earlier. Is that okay? You're saying we would the in order to say my model explains the variations we see, you need to specify which variations you would not expect to see in this case. So I'm oh, asking you, what oh. variations here would you not expect under common design? That's a two a that's world? It's too difficult of a question because it would be like me too looking difficult. at, the, well, we have millions of different designs across many manufacturing companies in terms of vehicles that are made, and they each have variation in, in the way their steering wheels are designed or the tires, the rims, the engines are oftentimes, you can find vehicles with engines in the middle. So am I going to be able to point to a, a certain vehicle? that I haven't analyzed or examined and predict, well, the variation of the steering wheel in, in this vehicle is going to look like this. It's just variation in design. I can't make yeah. any real specific predictions on that. Well, well sure, but you can't like compare the variations. The the question, though, are you bringing it up? Yet. Like Grayson, uh, I would like to hear. Yeah, so my sorry. biggest question is, you say that there are these like supposed intermediate environments, which is not found in any of the actual literature, but you're saying that it's these intermediate environments that create these fossils that have intermediate features. But my big question for you is, why is it that we only find these fossils with intermediate features between two groups that are genetically similar? Well, it's the same. Well, I, I'm not expecting to find some crocodile, you, a, a creature that looks like an ape, but also a fish as well. Like why not? Only, well, it, it, it wouldn't fit the design model in terms of God creating creatures that can reproduce, pass on their genes. So if he never created a creature that wait, looks wait, wait, like... Wait, 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 Donnie. But how does there being intermediates at all, like predictable intermediates, you're saying that the creation model can accommodate for these and predict because of some intermediate environments. How does that fit the creation model when it's only between two groups that are genetically similar? Well, here's the thing, though, and it's a good question. I appreciate it. Your your fishapod, Tiktaalik. Yeah, it, it has features or traits similar to fish and amphibians. 
but not fish and birds or fish and an ape. Well, in the same way, in, in the design world, in the design world, we have a crossover SUV. It's not like it's well, we got this SUV with a airplane wings coming out of it. <laughs> Okay, go ahead. Whatever. Go ahead. Just go forward one slide, please. Yep. There right, you go. Exactly. There you a go. car yes. and a boat, two distantly related vehicles with an intermediate, because in design, you can have intermediates between distantly related things. But in evolution and in the real world with the fossils, we actually find you don't find that. Is Tiktaalik not a tetrapod? <laughs> Or I mean, is, is it's, an, it's it is not a tetrapod. It no, is. Or, I mean, a is a sarcopterygian fish, meaning it a lobe fin fish like a coelacanth right. or a lungfish, and it has intermediate features between more basal sarcopterygians like a coelacanth and something like an amphibian, which not only was predicted by Neil Shubin and colleagues. That has been what the evidence has pointed to for decades. Are that amphibians? Okay, well, I just looked it up. Tetrapods. Wait, wait. Let, let me let me respond. Tetrapods include all extant and extinct amphibians and amniotes. Yes. Tiktaalik is a circle. Oh, but no, wait, wait, I, I think Mark, you just said no. When I said amphibians or tetrapods, you said no, or were you saying no to something else? No, you said it's tiktaalik and uh, a tetrapod. Tiktaalik. Yep. You said tiktaalik is. Well, a, but, but then I corrected myself real no. quick and said I mean amphibians, and then you stood. So you must well, have said no. No, no, I just said no. I just said no, and then you said well, you know, and then corrected yourself. Don't. And don't then you changed of... your tune. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. Hey, hey, hey. hey, 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 hey Okay, so the hey, point I'm trying to make here is an like, amphibian. I feel like I'm being used here to make okay, some so, sort of... Hold on. I, no, you I'm correct to yourself. To that's fine, Donny. I just, I said no when you said it, you know, and then you correct it. That's fine. It's not a problem. Okay, that's fine. It's good. Let's move... Because you said no after I said amphibian, so I thought you were saying no to amphibians, but you're saying to a tiktaalik. So that's good. We're all good. Well, it man. takes people so time to I react to things. Hey, uh, Dr. Dino, I was trying to ask you something earlier. In regards to the tiktaalik situation where, you know, they predicted it and they found it, how many can you can you quantify like how many times that has happened you know, in the last hundred years? Like, has any hey, hey, before, I, I really want to respond to Grayson's I point don't here. Don't think Tektolix is oh, an amphibian okay. either. I would also just direct you to watch my video where I documented several, yeah. like, <laughs> over a dozen of these examples of predicting transitionals and finding. Right. Them. Yeah, yeah. Hold on, Donnie yes. still wanted to respond to you, Grayson. Yeah, I just want to address the question. Yeah. So Tektolix is. It blends the features of what fish and amphibians, right? So, so here, fish and no, right, it, it, a very it blends specific the features, fish Johnny, with, it with blends the features of lobed finned fishes and tetrapods, right? Yeah, yeah I understand. A, a not amphibians, it's fish. not an amphibian. So, but right here with your amphicar, it is a, a car built for the land going from A to B, just a typical sedan, and then also a, a boat, something that belongs in in the sea or the ocean, okay? And with Tiktaalik, same thing, something that's on the land and then also something that's built or designed for the water, for the sea, the ocean. So that's what we see with this Amphicar. But we don't see like a sedan and then somebody just slapped on a couple of airplane wings. And sure, okay. humans can do that. Humans can get very We creative. can do that. That's the point, Donnie. And look. Obviously, really because we can go in and just make something up, exactly. but it's probably not going to last very exactly. long. Exactly. That's the entire well, it's point. not look, exactly, because I've never picture, said that it's just this black and now, white. With that picture, okay, first of all, lobe-finned fishes and tetrapods are two adjacent groups. Okay, they're they're genetically similar. Well, so are SUVs and vans. They're they're adjacent. If you go exactly. to any car wait, lot, no, you're gonna have vans hold, on one side. Hold on, Donnie. Hold on. Have SUVs right next to it. Hold on, very... Donnie. Are boats an adjacent group to sedans? I wouldn't say they are. No. And yet, in your slide, in the next slide here, there is an intermediate between a sedan and a boat. Because right. when when things are designed, when these intermediates are designed, you can make an intermediate between any two groups. Like you said, you could design an airplane sedan or an airplane truck or an airplane SUV when you're designing these things. Right, but you could have a four wheel any intermediate. Right, but but you could have a four wheeled sedan kind of vehicle that's designed pretty close to what a boat is, but not quite as a boat. And then you can mix in and get a, a vehicle like this amphicar because an amphibian 
does walk on land. It is okay, a tetrapod. You, you realize that there's also boat airplanes. There's a there's, boat there's airplane. There's plenty of hybrids that are there's designed a bunch. between any yeah. two. Right. Humans can design some pretty wild things, but guess what? People aren't buying those. Usually they go extinct. Like, for no, example, you can't go to the local Listen, you can't go to your local car lot and buy an amphibian. You can't Same buy a plane. bond bug today. The point can, is, they don't last, they don't work, about? people don't want them. But something like a crossover SUV, people like, people want, it's functional, it's a big seller. And what do we have? A van and an SUV that are, what's the word you used? Adjacent. And we've got a crossover well, SUV. And guess what? That Johnny, works. Will you just people acknowledge like the point that when you're when these things are designed, you can design hybrids between two non adjacent I get we can well, get well, I, I'd like to say I something because I haven't I said anything for a while. Please. Um so you're, you're you're completely ducking away from seaplanes. They're a basically a plane with pontoons on the bottom that can be used as a boat because they can just wind the propeller and, and move through the water and you can fly them. They're literally seaplanes. Thank you, Donnie. That's great. I mean, yeah. I, I would say that, that supports my model. Yeah, we can find some very interesting mosaics. Yeah. No. We can design some no. very interesting. Donnie, please. Transitions are and... extremely exaggerated. Donnie, will you acknowledge that when these things are designed, you can design intermediates between two non-adjacent groups? Do you acknowledge that? I do acknowledge that. But here's the thing. I've never said that it's this perfect black or white dichotomy. We find some vehicles like the crossover SUV that nicely fits what we would expect based on finding something like Tiktaalik. But yeah, if okay. we find this boat that's so mixed with an airplane, yeah, that, that's that's very creative. That's the so creativity of man's mind. <laughs> if you acknowledge that you can design things that are have intermediate qualities between two non-adjacent groups, show us because you claim that life is designed. So show us the fossils that show intermediates between two non-adjacent groups. But here's Grayson, the thing. Can you, you wouldn't define expect adjacent? that fine just based on the basics of biology, of reproduction, of gene flow. Okay, why, why would we expect something? Because God would have had to originally create something like what we're looking at, where you've got... How some, do you know that? Some bo a fish that has wings on it. God chose well, not to claim. How do you know that, Donnie? Listen, we only know what we know. We have the biological world. We have the fossil record. And we don't find anything like a fish that has wings on it like a bird. Exactly. Yeah, Despite the fact that mm -hmm. human designs mix and match features all the time. But the, the, my whole point is I'm not looking for something so, like we see on screen as a comparison in terms of the patterns. What I'm looking at is, okay, we got something did, like to call you literally we say we don't have plane boats? I understand the evolutionary explanation that you're looking, and I watched Grayson's video several times. It was well done. And he's picking two uh, species that you would argue are closely related, like humans and non-human primates. So you find Australopithecines. You're not looking for something between humans and fish, okay? Or bear dog. That's something between Ursidae and Canid, okay? So I went in looking for intermediate vehicles that match that same pattern. Yeah, we're going to find other vehicles that don't match it because humans can do whatever they want. I can go and build something exactly. crazy today. I can go thing. I I like I'd like to say here. something. I'd let's, like to say something. I'd like to say something. I'd like to say something. Yeah, so we do find fish with, with wings, basically. They're called flying fish. And okay, but the, well, the whole go. point is, well, the whole point is, is that their morphology is based upon like, um, um, their, their fins aren't like wings, right? Like, so you have seabirds like cormorants and terns and things like that, the, the diving birds that have wings. Um, their, their wings aren't wings like a diving bird. They're, they're wings as in their they're fins, gliding. their modified fins. They, they glide, right? like, like flying th squirrels. They mm -hmm. glide, right? Yeah. So these modifications are showing that they weren't just designed it's adapted from what already exists, just as a cormorant's wings that can be tucked up so it can dive really deep are modified by what already exists. And that supports evolution. It doesn't support common design because if God wanted to design a fish that could fly, it would use wings. And, and just to add on to that real quick, because specifically what you're talking about here, Mark, is they they adapted pre-existing structures 
that were present in their immediate common ancestors, whereas what Grayson was pointing out here, human designers are adapting structures from completely different design manufacturers and repurposing right. them from there. They're mixing and matching them. They're, They're completely and different patterns there. That's the point. Mm -hmm. And and when you talk and, about those hind legs that are used for sexual, uh, for, for copulation, that's what we're talking about with this definition of vestigial is that they're changing the function from its previous function. So I, it's, it's may, I, may I touch on a couple things? There's been a couple things I've been wanting to talk about for a bit now. Yeah, me too. Well, you, you start, um, Doc. Go ahead. Okay. So first I want to address... Uh, what T Rock said a business week ago about a presentation about carbon fourteen being found in dinosaur bones. I just want to say, T Rock, I read through the lab results that that guy was basing his presentation on. It is contamination. Some of the bones he had tested, they were literally charred. It had been in a fire. They were contaminated. Sorry, it's not evidence for a young Earth. In fact, most of the dates that they even got are between, or sorry, they're either 20 to 50,000 years old, or they're like 200 years old. And you can't really do radiometric dating, or sorry, you can't really do carbon dating on stuff that's that young because of the Industrial Revolution. Real so quick. either way... His results don't work. Real quick, Doc, you do realize that in the secular version of the story, dinosaurs were wiped out by a meteor impact with a lot of ash and stuff like that falling out, right? Is that a yeah, it has question? nothing to do with this. Is that a serious it's a complete question? Non -secular. The, the I'm point sure being, Doc, Doc knows about that. Uh, yeah, me too. Yes. That's the point being. Oh, okay, wait, you know that Doc knows about that, so you're just being intentionally condescending? No, get to no. the point. The, the the point is, where did the char come from? What the was char? the source of the, what? Yeah, was, the was, was it fire? contamination okay. after the fact, or do you think that was there already in this specimen? So, let let me answer that. So, T Rock, what happened when the dinosaurs were obliterated? Was an asteroid the size of Mount Everest blasted into Mexico? That did send a lot of ash up into the stratosphere, laced with a ton of iridium. That's why there is a layer of iridium in rocks almost exactly 66 million years old everywhere on Earth that they're preserved. Literally everywhere. Where we have dinosaurs below, mammals above, and we don't see much mismatch. That, yeah, it made a crater that's 12 well miles deep. On the bone, char refers to, like, charcoal the direct after effects of a fire not what we would see in a not what we would see in a fossil i'm so, sorry this so you you're kind of making my point for me you're 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 saying that neither meteors nor volcanoes can produce any kind of burned material yeah but so can fire no, they can. it's just that this was in a fire like, this bone was burned, and that's the one that's 200 years old. It made a um, crater 120 miles wide. I just like pointing that out when, whenever this is caught up. Yeah, it's sorry. Hey, Rock. You I, never did this. No, I think, no, I think it's rest. hilarious and that you're, you're basically saying this. Point. This point. That you got know where this fire this came from, and yet nothing. you have no study whatsoever to show. Is there any you know reason why you should think? From the who, study. Who, who dug it up and burned it 200,000 years ago? And and also, did you, did 200, you know? 200,000 years ago, it's 200 years ago. Doc, did you know no, that there was more than one type of dinosaur in that study? You do yes, and they grew between 200, 2,000, 25,000, and 50,000 years old. Yeah, so probably contaminated. The bones in the study are too old to fit in your young Earth, even if this was accurate, and it's uh, not. That's a, that's a complete red herring, because the... the, the no, creationist, creationist position is... You don't understand. Are, 
the creationist That's not position a red is that those are not ages at all, Doc. They the the point is is that C fourteen cannot exist for in excess of a million years. Sorry, it can't, no. It can't Rock, exist in here's your source. That's years. a red herring. This is your Rock, source. Hey, this is your source here. And sorry, I was wrong. The charred bone is twenty five thousand years old. This is your source. They calculated the age. You haven't looked up your source, have you? Um, because you sent a link to the guy's presentation on YouTube. This it's, is his actual results. This is what you share to prove your point. Those, do you not see that column that says PMC? You keep saying age, but they're giving an age equivalent, but they're it's called percent modern, modern carbon for a reason. Hey, Rock, it literally says radiocarbon C13 corrected age. That's what the mouse point. cursor is. That's, That's literally what point. it says. There, there is a term that. that. Age. There is a term called carbon age. The whole, the whole point is that it is not an actual age. It's a carbon age. It's called that for a reason because it's not an age. And they do not I need you to age. understand this. This I is the this the is the independent between. variable. This is the percentage of modern carbon. That's how you get this number. It's a simple equation. You um, don't know what you're talking about on this. It's called a carbon age for a reason. They call it a carbon age because they are acknowledging it's not an age. What? It's, what it's are not you a simple point. What talking about, T-Rock? I don't there think is, he knows. <laughs> when, yeah, when do you, like, T-Rock... The age is given there. Like you're you're putting across this as to completely Sorry. like put the age is shown in the paper. The radiocarbon the age after correcting for age. modern carbon is what Doc is saying. Mm -hmm. It's a corrected age. And what so I'm saying is if there's a specific terminology it's called actually, carbon age that tells yeah. you they don't think it's the age. Iraq, that's exactly what it means. It means that the no. that's the age of the specimen. No, no, there is a difference between an age and a carbon age. And you don't Iraq, you're it. talking to a paleontologist and what are you, right. Grayson? Are you a geochemist or a biochemist? I have a degree in biochemistry. I don't know which one. Biochem and organic chemistry. Yeah. Or this is what this means, T Rock. That's what it means to an evolutionist. Ah, oh, no, that's come on. <laughs> these, do you not understand they the, the, that they deliberately do you do you wait, not wait, understand that they deliberately delineate the your basically your faith hey, in a means God. this it means this thing to scientists, but I'm gonna take my own meaning with blackjack no, and hookers. No, I mean Mark, come on. Read some literature. They distinguish between age and carbon age. It's two different Rock. things. Rock, I have a degree in this stuff. Okay, no, I don't. really never you agree don't wants to join. I about. really want I really want to see this happen. So I'm gonna actually I'm gonna jump out so he can go in. Because this well, is I think this I, is gonna be hilarious. But I, I, I wanted to listen, I'll, I'll, I'll have a degree in this. I'll, I'll have it go for another 10 minutes or so, but we are at the four and a half hour mark and I'm getting pretty tired. Yeah. But I did want to ask, yeah. And my wife wants to hang out a little bit before she goes to bed. So, you know, we got to make, we got to make the wives happy. So I no, wanted to ask. Honey, you got to stay for another five hours. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's tempting. It's tempting, but man, yeah, it's been fun. I was curious as to Grayson, since he's the tiktalicologist. Tic is that what it is? You got a PhD in tiktalic. No. So <laughs> what are your thoughts on what this article is saying? Was it you that brought up the uh, the the bones of the wrist in in Tiktaalik in the hand, the wrist and I finger like that was bone? Me. I believe that was me. But I've mentioned the wrist bones and the neck bones before in Tiktaalik, yeah. So, and I'm agnostic on this. I'm just curious as to what your thoughts of what this article is saying about how the fins of lobe fin fish have a lot of variation in their bone structures, and Tiktaalik's bone structure is not surprising or unusual in that it could uh, be argued that the bones of a modern lobe fin look more like a wrist with fingers than Tiktaalik's. And here's the different wrist and 
finger bones. What are you, what are your thoughts on that? Speak to it. How does it look more like a wrist than the modern ones? You know, like he's... the coelacanth is the only one there that's modern, right? All the other ones are extinct. Mm -hmm. Right. So I, I don't understand how the modern one is supposed to look more like a, a wrist. And where is this source, by the way? What is this paper? It's uh, back to it's a, it's a creationist source, but that's why I'm curious. So... You can, Don, find can you here. back up to the image real quick? Chris Roop did a big study on Tiktaalik, and I'm just curious as to yeah. it, maybe you can read this, Grayson, and see where you oh, disagree. Donnie, oh, could you go to the comparison image again, please? Yeah. Okay, let me walk you through this. So we have Tiktaalik over there. Tiktaalik has what is analogous to the humerus, radius and ulna, the, the bones of your wrist, and then your fingers. That's what Tiktaalik has. The coelacanth, if you know the anatomy, it has an extra bone, which is like your shoulder socket, mm -hmm. then your humerus, then your radius and ulna, then your fingers. And then attached to that shoulder is another little arm. It's, it's not more similar. It has an extra arm there. If you want to talk, if you want to talk homologous features. Okay, so you would challenge this, this sentence here. Its morphology is entirely consistent with that of modern lobe fins. You wouldn't agree with that, then, based on what you just said. No, its morphology is entirely consistent. I'm just saying the modern coelacanth isn't. It isn't more analogous to, let's say, a human limb than Tiktaalik is. If you read the anatomy. So could it just be natural variation within lobe fin fish then? Not necessarily transitional? No, because... Okay, not exactly. Tiktaalik has a wrist joint, a developed wrist joint. That's not present in the coelacanth. I'm also, I'm like looking at skeletons of coelacanth right now, and they do not look like that image that is presented in that paper. Like the actual coelacanth lobe fins the the anatomy looks pretty different than what that that cartoon in the are paper you, are is you showing. looking at modern or or um fossil coelacanth yeah latimeria or yeah both yeah. i mean I'm, I'm looking at a modern one um and it just doesn't look like that at all i mean i maybe i could share my screen or whatever yeah you want to share it? yeah let me just do that real quick uh share screen Oh, also, a real quick, Donnie, I'm going to set up an after show on my channel. I'll send you the link. Okay. So that's what I'm seeing. Um, and it's like multiple, too. It's not just this one picture. Like if I zoom out. Um, oh, yeah. Wait, which bone did he pick? Like, and here's one that's in a museum. Like, <laughs> I don't know, man. Like, I'm not sure what the image is supposed to be showing, but I can't find any. Like, here's a fossil. It just doesn't look uh, like the, the picture. It's in not tight. We'll put him on trial. Put him on trial. <laughs> Donnie, can you pull up the original image again of the comparison? I want to see if I can find what fish he's looking at. That did not look right. You're going on trial. You're going up against Mark, Grayson, Doc. I mean, honestly, I think Gutsuck Gibbon did a fabulous job of putting Roop on trial. He's not very good at this. I, I told Chris that he should respond to Erica's series. I do my best. <laughs> oh, that'd be hilarious. So, sorry, I'm not trying to be condescending. My brain is. Oh, I agree that creation is yeah. gender. That is viewpoint. not a coelacanth. What is that? Well, it says coelacanth Wait, or similar modern lobe fin. So maybe. He's uh, just, uh, yeah. Let's That's see. Figure D. No. Well, it, it, says, it says figure D here are the bones of lobe finned fish and show a natural variation is his argument. Is it the tail fin or something? I, I don't even know where that came from. Hold on. Let me do a Google image search. Let's find out. He says it is hard to imagine how one looks any more finger like or wrist like than the other. I'm also well, looking I at found a fossil. I mean, okay, here's another, uh... <laughs> okay, let me present my screen one more time here. Um, here's a comparison of some other fish. I mean, they don't look like what was presented. 
this is like a Cantus stega. So this is similar to a Tiktaalik, but like this is a lungfish. This is a lobe finned modern fish. It looks very, very different. So I don't know what where Roop was getting that image from. Honestly, whatever that is, it looks more similar to Sauropterus than it does any kind of coelacanth I can find. Well, what are your thoughts on that? As we start to wrap things up and allow people to transition, hey, no pun intended, over I to think you might have labeled it. Unless I can find the actual image. I, I not I find that's it right. any search anywhere. Neff, what are your thoughts on Tiktaalik? And what's been said so far. Bro. Hey, am I in there? It doesn't look like I am. Am I in? You're here. Oh, okay. Oh, well, I love this subject of fish to land dwelling thing. I've written an extensive article on it. There are massive problems with this idea. The snout bones, roofing bones of these creatures that they put in this lineage, it doesn't work. It's a fishtail, that's for sure. What you can't the genetic pathways to create these kinds of up and down increase and decrease in complexity and the number of roof, uh, roof and snout bones on those creatures it makes a preposterous story. It's like believing a bicycle became a Mercedes Benz, then went back to a motorcycle, then became a Dodge truck, then went back to a bicycle, and then became a Mercedes again. It doesn't work. Okay, there's lots of big problems with the fish to land dwelling thing, and Acantha Sega. That's a that's a giant uh, salamander. That's all that thing is. They picked a creature, a, a, a um, giant salamander fossil out of the uh, ground. Not a canthostega, but um, yeah, a canthostega. That's not. It, look at the anatomy of it, and then look at a photograph of a giant Chinese salamander. That's what it, it is. It looks like an amphibian. Yes. How many adult salamanders do you know that have internal gills? Just out of curiosity. Also, Donnie, there is the link to the stream yards. Okay. Thanks. Um, I I set it to start at twelve fifteen, so that gives you they an do. out. <laughs> they have they have them. Maybe you're not aware. <laughs> what? <laughs> how how do similar? Any, do you have any? Uh, can I get a citation on that sort of you know this problem with the the upper palate and and um, sure. sort of I'm... mouth bones and stuff? Like something oh, saying, hey, roofing bones and the number roofing and arrangement bones. of roofing and snout bones in these creatures that they put up as a lineage goes from fewer to many, many more to fewer to many, many more to fewer to many, many more. That's a preposterous story. Why? But what's the problem? Why? Because the genetic pathway to produce the bones is, is what creates it. Okay. There's nothing imaginable in natural selection which would cause a creature to develop, to suddenly develop over a period of, let's say, one million, two, three million years at most. Did you know that evolutionists believe that the whole transition between fish to land-dwelling creatures they've been saying for uh, 60 years took place in four and a half million years? Now, you take four it's and a half so... million years and try to, to, to come up with a scenario with, with natural selection, which is going to take a creature and create time and a half as many bones in its skull. That's just not true. And then fewer, hey, and then twice so... as many, and then fewer, and then more again, so, and then fewer. So, Neff, Neff, mm -hmm. so the amount of bones in your skull is actually a highly variable trait. Humans have variable numbers of bones in their you skull. You realize the gravity the of the problem. Do you know how no, many? Hey, Neff, Neff, no, you let no, us do. Yeah. It, hap it happens a lot in many organisms, again, including humans, and especially in fish, because fish have a lot of bones in the skin, and those change all the time. They can change between generations. Also, Neff, I just want to say that uh, Acanthostega does have did have internal gills and Chinese yeah. salamanders, which you said it was like, do not. There's a lot of other skeletal differences. Okay, there's much, much to be said about this subject. You don't realize the gravity of the problem. We're not talking about one or two little bones somehow, uh, you know, a, a genetic variety that produces a bone. We're talking about gross difference in anatomy. I'm not talking about an increase of three or four bones. I'm talking about 50% as many bones all of a sudden appearing. And then going away again, and then coming back Fine even, all even of a more, sudden. and going and and well, what you think is sudden is what two hundred fifty thousand. No, no I, I want I want to know what you think is sudden. What do you, you mean? You, just said, you, said. you just said 
in the genetic and, and, years. and the evolutionist timeline, a hundred thousand years is a drop in the bucket. That's so, nothing. so Neff, if the but bones now, in the skull you can to change explain from generation, yeah, generation let, to generation, let, let Doc speak. He's not interrupting you. Yeah, Doc, go ahead. Speak. Go ahead, Doc. So, Neff, if the bones in a skull can change from generation to generation, and I don't know, let's say that your average amphibian has a generation time of, let's be generous, 10 years? How many generations can you have in 50,000 years? The, the problem is more than that. Can you imagine, tell us what is a logical scenario by which natural selection of creatures that live in the same kind of environment now they are in the same kind of environment. What in the world possible natural uh, selective pressures would exist to cause the bones in the skull of an animal to increase by 40% and then decrease so, again when they live so in the same question. environment? There has to be an environmental pressure that would cause a, ra a radical increase and then decrease and then increase and decrease and increase so, again in the number of roofing yeah. and snouting bones. What logic would answer your question? Let, let, finish there your be? question, dude. Just to answer your question, first off, the answer was 500. That's 500 generations minimum. Second, they can have a lot of factors that influence the joints and the skull and how many individual bones you have. The more individual bones you have, the greater amount of flexibility you have, which can help you get more food or fit into smaller spaces. It can even make breathing easier. A lot of things can happen when you change the number of bones in the skull. On the other hand, if you want more protection, Reduce the number or thicken the ones you have. It's pretty easy to explain the pressures. Mm, uh, but the creatures, here's the problem. They live in the same environment. That's the thing. They both live in an aquatic environment. There is no common sense that, to believe that the number of roofing and snouting bones somehow needs to change so that the flexion of the skull increases and then decreases I mean, again. So, so here's so the problem. If we're Within talking this, about tectology... Please, let, let me finish this one thought. This is really critical. All right. In the same environment, today. in the environment in which they increased and then decreased and increased again, and, and they did this more than once, mm -hmm. twice they would have to have at least... The in selective pressures are the same. They still live in an aquatic environment. You're telling us that the selective pressure is the ability for the bone, the skull to flex so that it can eat larger prey. Okay, sounds logical. Can but be. then they decreased, okay, and then increase mm -hmm. again and decreases and then increase again in the same environment. There's nothing okay. in sure. Neff. Neff. So, Neff. 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 I'd like to say something. I'd like to say something. Yeah. I've been very quiet. So Neff, like you've sure. got to, like you're sort of straw manning evolution because the environment yeah. is always changing and selective pressures are always changing. In most areas, even savanna and stuff and, and, and whatever environment that you're talking about, you will have competitor species that are also changing in order to get some sort of advantage. I know you don't believe in evolution. Let's, let's say they're adapting. Right. So if one fish and, and great, uh, uh, sorry, Doc explained this really well. If one sort of thickens its armor, they might have an advantage. So another one might, they might have smaller bones so they can fit into crevices to hide. So there is always selective pressure provided by competitive species. So the whole idea that because an environment is always wetlands or always this environment, that there aren't selective pressures. I'm really sorry, Neff, that's just wrong. You didn't answer a thing. You're just telling us in the same environment, selective pressure is bouncing up and down. That just well, doesn't make it. sense yeah. because the environment is the I thing that it. creates the selective pressure. And moreover, yeah. the, another problem, great problem yeah, real is quick, real quick. the genetic, Can I answer it? The, the genetic pathway. Hold agree? on, please. Yeah. The genetic I, I pathway to real quick. One sentence. Hold on. We, we, we don't know of any genetic pathway to the creation of new bones. Nobody okay, Neff, knows Neff. of such a thing. Before you start bringing sorry, up new we do, but Neff. sorry, Grayson, you first, but we do. Before, no, Neff, but we before don't. you start bringing up new points, let's just address what has been stated. You should agree that there are multiple niches in the same environment. And if an organism goes from one niche to another niche in the same environment, that will be different selective pressures. These creatures have similar anatomy. They have similar diet. You're telling me that selective pressure changes radically when they live in the same environment and have the same kind of diet. How These do you know they have the same diet? I mean, they're both aquatic. What are they going to eat? Things that swim oh, around oh, in the all, water. All, all aquatic, aquatic things have aquatic, the same yeah. diet? Yeah. 
No, it's just an imaginative story you're giving. Oh no, about. no, Neff, please answer the, this. The Do all aquatic organisms have enough. the same diet? That that raises a Our whole other problem because now they're eating themselves at the same time. So some How are they evolving fast enough and eating themselves? Listen, they yeah, all they're, like they're, McDonald's. They're, they're they love Arby's. Trying to undermine the, the, the brevity of the situation. With I, I'm, I'm just stories. curious as, as to the thoughts from the evolution side, Mark and uh, Grace. I appreciate your point. So basically, and if you disagree with this, just tell me why. If environments are always changing, based on what I've been hearing, and environment dictates phenotype, and organisms, we would all agree, also change and adapt, why can't we have creatures like Tiktaalik that are simply a product of their environment? And not ne necessarily transitional. Well, why not both? The organisms. I mean, you can have both. So you have a, a sort of stabilizing selection where, um, like sharks, for instance, they're stabilized because they're very, very well adapted to their environment. So as time progresses, you will get this stabilizing selection where something will be more and more better adapted. So something like a tectolic may find a niche in order to like for instance they may be able to escape the the very very selective pressured um fish in the water by having an ability to walk upon land and that is the selection pressure like this is i answered your question nephilim i answered it it's basically other organisms provide selective pressures this is still considered part of the environment that the creature is in so the, the environment is changing it <laughs> excuse is. me what you're trying to tell us is the diet I'm sorry, of the rescue creature. rescue you? You're trying to oh, tell no, us that the sudden... creatures stopped eating small animals and, and then went for the big ones, then went to the small ones again, then to the big ones. Why it, not? It, it, it doesn't make sense. Why doesn't that make sense, Neff? Right, because yeah, it's it always a just some fish story. today. Again, this deciding factor is the environment and the genetic pathway. Firstly, yeah. we don't know the genetic pathway to the, to the increase in, in, in number of bones and arrangement of bones. I'll, I can cite for you an article from paleos.com, which criticizes uh, the reconstruction of ichthyostega by Per Alberg, University of Uppsala paleontologist. They, they, so they, this is what they said about his ideas that ich, uh, the ichthyostega gained bones from fins in this fish thing. They said it's like a, ra uh, a magician pulling a rabbit out of a hat because we don't know of any now this these articles are written by paleontologists sorry we we don't okay. know of any what we, we don't know of of a mechanism which causes a bone to split to become two bones that's what they had to be to do the bone okay that's just blatantly gets false a process no they the bone gets a process where no, the bone okay. begins to diverge i'm telling you what evolutionist scientists say no, you're the not. bone begins Nephil, get, i am one of those sorry, people sir, let me finish my sentence please the, the bone gets a, gets a process in it. It's called a bone process. And that process begins to split the bone and it develops over time and you get two different bones. Now you have another bone. That's what the evolutionists believe would have had to have happened to create so, these Wait, wait, bones, wait, wait, right? wait. Nephilim? You... says that's like a rat Neph... pulling a rabbit out of a hat. Neph, you've been going for a while. You just said well, we didn't have an explanation. That is your explanation. And it's not fantasy, we can see this happening in living organisms. If, if we, we see know that how happening. bones, not enough. You wanted to finish. Let me finish. We know how bones develop. There is a bunch of there are several different ways, but let's take the bones in your skull as an example because we were talking about that earlier. The bones in your skull mostly form from plates of cartilage. Now those plates of cartilage can be split up into smaller pieces or fused into bigger pieces, depending on the expression of a couple different genes. Those can happen, again, from generation to generation, resulting in more or less bones. If the change in bone number or shape confers an advantage, it will be selected for in the population. I'll also so I know that's, that's, that's a story. Really quick, and more. Neff, before, we jump in, before we jump in, Neff, really quick, I just want to point out that there are species, and within species, that you would agree, like, new bones have been the result of mutations. There are humans that have more than 206 bones. There are humans that have more vertebrae than normal. There are like domestic pigs have more vertebrae than wild pigs. So you even agree in your own model, new bones can be the result of mutation. 
Okay, so you're, you're confusing that subject. That would have to explain five minutes, the error that you just made. But let me just cite for you. I'm just going to quote for you. <laughs> Paleos.com on this matter of the El Elginopterans femur are coming into being by a brone process. And they state, and I'm quoting them from my own article, quote, several parts of Per Albert's paper have a cuvier like magical quality to them. In particular, his reconstruction of almost an entirely pelvic girdle out of a little nubbin, a broken bone, which is like watching a magician pull a living tetris donsel out of a hat. One is tempted to applaud and gasp, even when he explains very clearly just how this trick is done. It is an incredible performance, particularly since Zoological uh, Journal of the Linnaean Society doesn't permit the use of bikini-clad assistance, deceptive lighting, and similar distractions. The section of the femur is almost as good. How However, there is a limit to what human reason can do with badly abraded example of the middle third of a single femur. And that's a quote directly from them. They, well, they are scathing. They, this is a scathing, your, scathing. Your citation for what you've claimed before. This I've noticed, a, noticed no link this, in private chat. Could you link that one as well, please? Like this, right now, this so is we a can have a look at it. This is a scathing criticism of Per Albert claiming that a new bones arise in the pelvis of these creatures by bone processes. It's an absurdity so, that we don't know of so such a thing. So, Nephilim free? What you're calling an absurdity is apparently a growing condition in a lot of young adults no, around you're, the world. You're, you're what you're looking you're at right here things, is sir. Nephilim free. What you're looking at is a spur of bone at the back of the skull that appears to be caused by changes in how the muscles attach to the skull because a lot of people are down staring at their phones, or at least that's what this article says. This is a change in a bone occurring within a generation or two. And this and I just want to point out, I just want to point out, I just want to point out that Nephilim and, isn't and, linking and, anything. Link and, what and, you've got there, Nephilim. And, link and, it right now, or and, else and, I'm just going to have to call you out and say that you're full of it because you're not uh, linking anything. Yeah. So what, what you're confusing yeah, is link it. a deformity, now, it. which has not become fixed in the genome no, and become part of the species. You're talking not about yet. genetic deform. Please let me finish. You're talking about genetic deformities which or, the organism always reverts to wild type. This is a process, what you're claiming is new bones arise by a new genetic pathway, and then the bone becomes fixed in part of the creature. That's not what we observe. We observe the organism reverts to wild type because deformities don't get passed on. What? They, they don't become a part genetic. of the genome. They don't become a part of the genome. Deformities are abnormal. Natural selection removes them. Genetic recombination removes it. It's gone. OK, you don't get the deformities your child has. Your, your children won't have a deformity. They don't give it to their kids and their grandkids don't give it to their great, great, grandkids. It doesn't happen. That's evolutionist nonsense. What we don't have <laughs> is, is deformities becoming fixed in the genome and becoming part of the anatomy. You That's are the so thing. silly. And, and, and that is what Paleos.com is, 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 is criticizing. Oh, no. Paleos.com. Oh, no. I don't even know what this site is. What, Can you what, link? What are you saying? Like, link it, Neff. Like, you must have the link okay. in front of you so to be I referring have... to this thing. So, link it. Well, I, I, I can try to, okay, but that takes me a minute. You can try to, to link copy. something. Sir, are you please, sir, three. Just, you click the listen. link at the top of the page, hit okay, Control C, click chat with everyone in the uh, studio, and press Control V. Uh, it's okay, not so listen, listen for a second, please. Just for a second, stop you gang banging. Okay? We've listened uh, to you for just, a long just time. Just listen to me for a second without talking over me. No, it's not going to be a second. Can one of you elect a leader from the atheist camp to talk at one time? Just one of you elect one person to talk from the atheist camp and interrupt that. Not all of you. Actually, guys, let me just oh, jump oh, yeah, in. Because, three or four of you at once. Guys, I, I just want to jump in because Doc is having an after show anyways. We've been going for five hours. I got to wrap things up. I'm pretty tired. We got another long show tomorrow as well. So this has been fun. Some people in the chat said all-star panel cast. It's been fun. We've had a good group and mix of uh, creatious and evolutionists. So everybody, if anybody wants to get something in there, final word, final thought, say it all at the same time if you want to, and then we're going to wrap it up. Thanks for being here, guys. Sure, Next I can time. go last. Okay, well, as we've seen, the the analogy with cars and vehicles and hybrids does not work because it's not similar to what we see in the fossil record. These are two distinctly different patterns. One is the result of design, 
The other one is clearly different than the pattern that's the result of design. In terms of what Nep is saying, it sounds like he literally just said that a genetic that deformity way. does not get passed on to your offspring, which anyone listening should recognize immediately is complete nonsense. He's just completely making that up. And I will oh await goodness. with bated Him breath and for Neff to link his quote. I already I'm did. Sure is not cherry picked. I now just did. Well, I already had. I already. I just did. Okay. Did in the so, private chat? Uh, no, it's in the public chat. Oh, okay, okay. Uh -huh. Yeah. So it's so, in the uh, YouTube chat. Do, do no, my takeaway from this do is we're going to end up on that. The evolutionist is representing misrepresenting biological science here in a grotesque manner with a with a uh, just a story. So wild types creatures revert to wild type after deformity. Deformities don't get continuously passed on. There's only one example that I can cite in, in history where this happens, and it's a duplication of a, 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 a homeobox gene that causes an entire family of people in Africa to have six fingers. That's the only one we know of. Only one. Okay, uh, so that, there, this, this is an imaginative part of the evolution fantasy. How about the families but, with tails? But what, what you don't also understand is this. What Per Alberg put forth and what the evolutionists put forth is not that new bones arise ex, uh, ex nihilo, right? What they say is a bone diverges becomes it becomes begins to split at a bone process to become two bones over time. That's how they think these things got new bones. Not you're you're believing something that evolutionist scientists themselves don't even believe. You're thinking a new bone pops into existence because a genetic pathway to create one that's somehow morphologically just the right shape to fit and somehow provide a new function pops into existence. What? We've literally seen that. We've literally that seen that. Not that, let, 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 that hang is on, not, hang on. Let, that let is not what evolutionist scientists believe. They believe bone processes occur and the bone diverges into two bones. That's where the new bone comes from. Not the, a deformity occurs and the creature gets a brand new bone out of thin air. Pow, there's a brand new bone. That's not what they believe. You don't even know what your own scientists believe. You're, okay, you're Matt, thank you. I, I, I appreciate it. Grayson, have a quick final word, then we're going to shut it down. Anybody who wants to continue the conversation, head on over to Doc's channel. I just posted his StreamYard link in the chat for people. Thank you. And like I'll I was do my saying, closing. we have literally seen examples of what Nephilim Frigis claimed was impossible in real time, and Neff even has to agree with it in his worldview because well, guess what? You misrepresenting the science. have different numbers of bones than wild pigs. You're misrepresenting the science. Please <laughs> mute Nerf. Thank you for watching, liking, and subscribing this video. And I want to give a big thank you to all the channel members whose support allows me to bring you more content like this in the future. Thank you so much, everyone.